A warm welcome to our audience and to Sean Whitaker, two of whose films are the topic of today's webinar. I hope that you've had a chance to watch them. If you have not, you can still do so after today's talk, and I will put links uh, to them uh, in the chat channel in the next few minutes. It, Sean is a freelance filmmaker, writer, and photographer based on the north coast of Cornwall. Over the years, he has made many visits to the mountains of North India. In 2016, he overwintered in Ladakh to film a journey that would become Buddha of the Chadar. And a year later, he returned to collaborate with local photographer Skarma Rinchen on the short film Passport Ladakh. Today, he's talking about his objectives in making the films, the journeys that they involved, the process of filming, and his relationships with the people who are the centers of the films. And joining him in conversation is James Croden, whose suggestion it was that we should invite Sean to talk to us and who has himself walked the frozen river. Ladakh is more accessible today than it was when James made his own journey, uh, but despite much new infrastructure, it remains remote in most people's experience, and it is in a very contested part of the world. And these films, in addition to their documentary and cultural characteristics, tell stories with political overtones that I suspect will come out in the discussion. Discussion will be led off by James Croden, but please put in your own questions using the Q&A button at the bottoms of your screens, and Sean, James, and I will do our best to make sure that they are answered. I will say no more for now, but welcome Sean and hand over to him. Right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, uh, Michael um, and the Society for inviting me along today to talk about these two films. Uh, also, thanks to James for putting me in touch with the Society. That's very kind of you. Um, so I, I've got a short presentation. I thought I'd put some pictures up while I'm talking. It's a bit more interesting. I'm going to try and do that now. All of these are shot in Ladakh over, um, well, since 2012 onwards, really. If I can share these with you, let's give it a go. So I'm hoping you can see this now. Is that up on screen? Are you seeing that? Okay, good. All right. So I'll let those pictures play. Um, so both films really came out of a love affair uh, with the DAC, which began in around 2000 on a summer visit uh, to track across Zanska, uh, a region in the back. Our route uh, skirted the Zanska Gorge, and our guide at the time happened to mention the Chadar um, uh, and the, uh, the role that it played for the community. So the Chadar is a winter, a winter route. You can see it there in the picture, um, on foot from the wide open Zanska Valley uh, along the tortuous Zanska Gorge uh, to its confluence with the Indus. What's truly remarkable about this uh, about this route is that it's almost entirely on ice uh, and it follows the surface of the frozen river. You could say it's one of the world's uh, old new ways um, because it's built uh, new every January and February um, when the river freezes. And then in March, as the temperatures rise, it's swept away again uh, until the next year. So historically, it was the only winter route uh, that connected uh, the Zanska villages and the region's capital in Ley. It wasn't until 2012 that I actually returned to Ladakh, although the Chadar was in the back of my mind all that time. Uh, I came specifically to walk the Chadar. Uh, even at that time, really, uh, only locals walked the route uh, for uh, a very pragmatic purposes of travel. Uh, so we began at Chilling village and followed uh, the Chadar to uh, Padum, uh, a town in Zanska Valley. Uh, it's a return trip, maybe of uh, 10 days or so at quite a pace. Uh, and then more trips followed in 2014 and 15 uh, with slight variations. For example, we came over a very high pass called St. Gilar, uh, pushing through quite deep snow, it was waist deep snow. Uh, or we exited the Chadar 
uh, via the Marker Valley, uh, both very beautiful uh, routes. So I shot a lot of photographs and you're seeing some of them now on these early trips, thousands actually, but never really capturing that sort of mercurial beauty uh, of uh, the area and that kind of uh, wild light uh, that is really only unique to Ladakh. In 2016, I took a year off work, um, ostensibly for professional reasons, but uh, actually to uh, stay in Ladakh over winter, stay in Leh over winter. Uh, the idea of a film came quite late. It was about two months before I left. Uh, so I cobbled together the gear I thought I'd need, uh, all pretty simple stuff that would fit really into a, into a shoulder bag. Uh, it wasn't particularly sophisticated. Uh, so I included a Super 8 camera, actually, which I bought from a boot sale for a couple of quid, uh, along with some uh, rolls of Super 8 film. So surprisingly, I also had the foresight to pack uh, about 30 rechargeable batteries, uh, which was fortunate because in the event, each lasts about five minutes in the, in the temperature of the shadow. So, you know, I, I had no idea about filmmaking, actually, and certainly no idea about making, about making this film. Uh, I knew it needed to showcase the beauty of the Chadar. It had to be a film that was looking outward. Uh, and I wanted to make a record of the Chadar uh, before road building uh, essentially rendered it obsolete. Uh, the Border Roads Organization of the RO of India uh, is building a road along the length of the Chadar uh, on the precipitous sides of the gorge. And they've probably shortened the Chadar now by about a half. Um, and so perhaps in a few years it will be complete. Sonam uh, is uh, a guide who was super keen to get involved in the project. I'd known him from 2012 onwards, a very reliable Sanskari guide, working freelance actually. Uh, he recruited his uh, rather bibulous friend Mipam uh, and Mipam brought his son along, teenage son, Sering, uh, and then completing the group was Tashi. Uh, he was a driver for a tourist outfits in Leh, uh, but there was nothing he liked more than a little adventure in the mountains on foot. So he uh, quit his job for a little while and came along with us. So it was a small group. Um, we got ready in Leh in the days before. We were idling around, uh, wondering about the narrative and how to string it all together. Um, oddly, at one point, I was even thinking about taking a piano along the chatter. I'm not quite sure why. No one could play the, play the, uh, play the piano, so I'm not sure what my logic was. Um, I suppose I was just looking for something different. Anyway, we ended up uh, in the back streets of Leh, where there's a shop selling Buddhas of all sizes. I had this idea that Mipam should carry a life-size Buddha along, and not surprisingly, he demurred, uh, and we, we negotiated. Um, weighing up the different uh, weights of Buddhas in the shop, uh, trying to find one that was large enough for cinematic purposes, but, but not large enough that it would kill us along the way. And uh, so we tried to film a few sequences in Leh uh, with uh, lesser or greater success. Um, I'd only just read the instruction manual to the camera on the way over, so I'm still getting to grips with things. Um, I thought if the worst came to the worst, I'd just shoot everything on Super 8 and then add sound uh, post-production. Trouble was I only had three film cassettes, so it would be quite a short film once it was edited. Fortunately, we got slicker. Uh, Sonam learned to, to uh, use the buttons on the sound recorder in a way that didn't scrub the perfect take uh, moments after it was made. Uh, Mipan began to relax a bit more in shot, and uh, we came to enjoy the, the whole uh, making of this film, actually. Once out of lay, things got easier. I think uh, there were fewer distractions, there were fewer onlookers, uh, we could focus a little bit better. So we, um, we got to this uh, crossroads, it's in the film. It's a very long straight road to Amla. And that was the first point really that we did filming outside Leh. Uh, it's a really photogenic uh, place there, but such a difficult um, location to film because there's so many army trucks plying up and down the road, we could hardly get uh, 30 seconds of silence to uh, to, to film this uh, scene. We moved on, did some filming just above the Indus on Super 8, uh, which uh, came out really, really nicely. It has a luminous quality, and that's exactly what I was looking for uh, in, in these um, snippets of Super 8 through the movie. 
Uh, we camped at Tilat Sumdo on the first night. That's the place that you see in the film where the camera pans out and meet Pam uh, and Sering tiny dots in the landscape. Uh, it was maybe the first or second of January and the chadar was, was still very thin. It was full of holes, uh, but we were going deliberately early because we wanted to see it new. Uh, and we thought filming uh, at that time would, would be uh, a much more uh, dramatic way of, of walking the chadar. So we traveled very light um, with sleds, though I carried a, a backpack. Our kit was basically stuff for shelter and warmth, uh, stuff for meals, stuff for filming. Uh, I couldn't resist bringing my Mamiya studio camera along, which is uh, about 2.5 kilos. It's quite a hefty thing, uh, but it was my only real luxury, actually. The Daki people on the whole, uh, they're true experts in convivial frugality uh, and minimalism in actually quite harsh places uh, like the Chadar. So, for example, if we arrived at a, at a cave on the Chadar, which is typically where we stayed, uh, they would make themselves at home uh, very quickly. There would be a, a fire burning, the pressure cooker would be whistling and, and socks would be steaming and there was general sort of jollity uh, prevailing. So it was, it was a most pleasant uh, trip actually from that perspective and the spirits were, were very high. We shot most of the Buddha of the Chadar on the fly. There were no set pieces, so what you see is really how it turned out. Uh, Unfortunately, nearly all the, scriff, the cliff scrambling sections uh, that, we, uh, that we did go unfilmed. And that's really because it was a little bit too risky to film in those conditions. Uh, to be floundering around with a camera uh, was, was too dangerous. However, um, uh, there are scenes of me, Pam, uh, that are really true to form where he's carrying the Buddha up, uh, up steep slopes and he's exhausted. Uh, and that's a, you know that's very true to life. It was a, it was a very difficult um, a journey with a, with something that weighed that that much. And he took a lot of risks. Uh, you see a, a section where he's crawling on all fours under uh, a rocky overhang on quite a narrow ice shelf uh, with rapids just to the side. Uh, well, that was pretty dangerous actually, and uh, people do die, people do die on the Chadar. Um, so yes, he took chances. But you know, he's actually tough as nails on all the trips that I've, I've been on with him over the years. I suppose his only real foible uh, is, is a predilection for the local rum um, in Narak village about halfway along. Uh, he was quite merrily tipsy by the time the tent was up and, uh, and we still had scenes to shoot. It's the scene across the bridge uh, where Meepam and Sering walk if you look, actually, you can see he's, he's quite tottery uh, and swervy, and, um, and Sering has a hand on his backpack trying to steer him in the right direction. Um, I think walking the Chadar is, is really an elemental experience uh, where you've got um, ice, fire, water, you've got sky, stars, and you know, actually, everything really uh, is exactly what it seems. Uh, everything looks super real uh, and nothing is really hidden. It, it's quite an extraordinary experience. Um, one of the advantages for us traveling early was the superabundance of, of driftwood en route, um, which makes it so easy in the evening just to get a fire going. Driftwood is, is called Chushing in, in Ladakhi, which is a beautiful name for it. Uh, when you pick it up, it's sun bleached, it's water worn, uh, you put it together, it almost looks like a pile of bones. Um, very, very, um, um, a very beautiful thing, actually, that driftwood on, on the channel. It sounds a little strange to say that, but um, anyway. There's a lot of juniper uh, washed down the river as well, and that, that burns with a beautiful fragrance. Uh, it really is uh, um, nice to smell that in the evening, burning away. Fire's a luxury when the, when the cold is that terrific. Uh, it's it's a sort of a dry cold, and it wants to take heat from everything. It's quite it feels quite hungry. It wants that heat. Sometimes my digital camera just uh, shut down completely. In fact, it couldn't cope with the cold. Uh, one of the coldest mornings was at Hannah Mill. I don't know uh, if, uh, if James would remember that that village, but it it, it seems to trap cold air at Hannah Mill. Um, Sonam 
uh, Sodom has a name for a place close by to Hanamel, calls it Crack Point, because everything uh, freezes and, and, and to such an extent everything cracks. So we got to Kasha, we stayed in the basement of the house, uh, close to the steps going up to the monastery. We shot a scene early next morning at the bridge. Uh, it was on Super 8 because it was too cold to fiddle around with buttons, actually. Uh, the Super Cam works just with a, with a trigger. Uh, it's easy to use in, in mittens and gloves, so um, and I put uh, a bit of sound on afterwards. We shot so much film at Kasha Monastery uh, because I was uncertain about the edit. I didn't really have an ending in mind except that that Meepam would deliver the statue to the monastery. Uh, so after days on the chatter, arriving at that monastery, it was uh, it felt like a, a redemption of sorts because it's a beautiful, um, elevated, um, uh, sunny spot even in winter. Uh, the, 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 the courtyard is bathed in, in a warm winter sun. Somehow none of us really wanted to let go of the Buddha. Um, uh, but, you know, before, before we put him in the, in the shrine room, I put a little ding on his in his stand so that if I came back, I would I would recognize him. So um, I suppose I'd like to say thank you to Simon Lex as well at this point, uh, because um, he gave me some advice on early edits. He's a filmmaker working in a completely different genre, but came in with some fresh eyes on the project. So uh, thank you, Simon, for your input there. Um, Passport Ladakh is a very different film in flavor and length, actually. It centers on the work of lay-based photographer Skarma Rinchen. Uh, through the 80s, Skarma ran a photography studio in the main bazaar of Lay. Um, most of his business came from the town's residents, uh, but uh, on request, he visited remote villages uh, to take photographs required by the residents for their ID cards because they're living in a high security border area. Over the years, he amassed an archive of thousands of these uh, negatives, uh, portraits of local people in rural areas of Ladakh uh, at a time of rapid cultural change. So his archive is fascinating in that respect. We met for the first time when I was looking in a shop for color film in 2012. Uh, his studio spans two floors. It's quite a ramshackle affair. Um, Reams of photographs stacked in the corners. A few old chairs uh, scattered around. Display cabinets with old Nikons, uh, none for sale, because I asked. Um, in the back room, there's cabinets full of hundreds of, uh, of boxes of old medium format negatives and, and 50 to a box. So, you know, thousands. In 2014, I bought 600 of these negatives for quite a princely sum at the time, and then another uh, 500. Uh, in 2017. Um, so I bought them sight unseen. I, I had no idea really what was going to be on them. And I think it was a purchase uh, driven mainly by uh, curiosity, nostalgia for uh, old Ladakh, uh, and also a uh, fascination with uh, photographic portraiture of any kind. So I spent months sifting through these negatives, digitizing them uh, at my kitchen table with, with a digital camera and a light box. Uh, just to, so that I could get a clear view of what, what was what was in there. Out of about uh, 1,100 negatives, there's probably 50 that I would I would go to the ends of the earth for. They're, they're really first-class portraits. Uh, I thought, you know, this was a photographer that should be better known, so uh, uh, I decided to make a film about it. Took a lot of persuading. Skarma's quite a shy uh, individual. Um, finally, he agreed in 2018. I returned. Uh, to Ladakh to uh, record a narrative, his narrative uh, for the film. Uh, he's got a really easy way of talking, um, quite laconic, quite uh, relaxed at times. Um, Ladakh, is his, Ladakh is his first language, uh, but his English is certainly uh, passable. Um, it's it's uh, uh, very easy to understand him. I thought it'd be great actually if he if he just simply improvised a narrative uh, in English, uh, but uh, he disagreed. He wanted to prepare some um, statements uh, that he could practice and become fluent in them. Um, it's very fortunate that I left the the sound recorder running because we we had conversations between these more formal recordings where he relaxed a bit more. Um, 
uh, it was more spontaneous, uh, spoke much more directly from memory. Uh, so in fact, I just use those because they, they just fit much better with, with a loose narrative style. Um, if you listen carefully, you can hear the chinks of uh, teacups in the background, and there's plenty of dogs barking. Um, dogs bark everywhere in lay all the time, uh, particularly at night. They really like to save it up for night. Um, we were in the uh, dining room, actually, at the Jigmet Guest House on Upper Tuckshire Road, quite central. It's one of the original hotels. It was there when the Gates to Tourism opened uh, early on uh, in the DAC, in the DAC's tourist um, uh, years. Stanson Selgal was there as well, Sanger, as he likes to be known, he was translating. So it's essentially a, a team of three of us, uh, you know, a very small project. So we had this idea to uh, head out uh, with Skarm, and he'd be riding a motorcycle through the countryside, but he hadn't been on a motorcycle for years. So um, Sanger gave him a crash course uh, on his Royal Enfield. And then when we thought that he was safe enough, we headed out. We took the back roads to stack the monastery across the old uh, iron bridge that you see in the film. We had another idea to film uh, to, to film Skarma photographing the young Rinpoche um, at Stackner. Uh, so we went uh, to one of the puja ceremonies. Um, we made a play of uh, putting uh, generous uh, amounts of money at the shrine, and um, Rinpoche saw it and we said, "Can we film?" And he said, "He said no." Uh, he was quite sullen. Um, he spoke by a translator, so I was joking with the translator. I said, where's the, where's the compassion in that? And, uh, and he said, just, you just said Rinpoche says no. So that was it, really. We couldn't, uh, we couldn't do it. I think we were all disappointed. I think, um, uh, I think Scar was disappointed the most. So I used Super 8 again in this film. Um, I just love the adaptability of Super 8. Uh, I love the grainy, uh, saturated look of it which seemed to work so well with the monochrome in this short, uh, short film. It breaks up the sequencing of stills quite well. Uh, Skarma wasn't really involved in the edit. Um, I sent him a copy of the film, uh, didn't get a reply, but he did uh, share it on Facebook. So I think that might be the seal of approval that I, that I, I should be satisfied with. Um, both of these films, very fun to make in their own way. Uh, Buddha of the Chad are more documentary uh, than Passport Ladakh, which has a more uh, lyrical brief. Both quite nostalgic films um, in their own way, which is ironic because, uh, in my experience, uh, most uh, people in Ladakh uh, aren't particularly nostalgic, uh, really, about their culture. Um, they're very forward looking. Um, uh, there's a lot of change in Ladakh. It's being driven mostly by a uh, military presence, a heavy military presence, because it's a, a border area. And you're probably aware of the uh, recent events uh, on that border from uh, various news bulletins. Um, I suppose from a, a civilian's perspective, then, any, any initiatives that are seen to improve their security are, are welcome, tend to be welcomed wholesale. So um, I'm just aware we've got a question and answer session, so I think I'm going to leave it there. Um, and uh, uh, James can get involved at this point. Uh, so thank you for listening. There we are. Can you all hear me? I hope so. Well, that was... Um, is that all right, Michael? Yeah, good. That was an incredible sort of resume of what I think are two extraordinary films. Um, I think I'll just sort of get, we'll go back to the Frozen River. Passport to Ladakh reminded me a little bit of um, Irving Penn, a bit like Irving Penn on a motorbike, um, which is extraordinary. I mean, you have a, um, he has great depth and they obviously responded to him in an extraordinary way. They trusted him and in those days, Westerners could not go to Changtang, I don't think. Um, I remember in 1977, um, there's no way you could go to even Nubra, and your, your time in Ladakh was very restricted in, as to where you could go. So I think he was um, 
I think it was fantastic. You've captured his essence and he's captured their essence. What is happening to the archive that still remains in Ley and what will happen maybe to the archive that you have yourself? Um, Sean, do you have your, your mute still? Yeah. Um, that's a good question. I mean, at the moment, it's it's all in you know in backroom cabinets in in his shop in in busy. Yeah. Um, I mean, know. do you think Lamo could get involved? I mean, it seems to me. I mean, seeing it, I've seen the film two or three times, and it has the film has its own quality, but um, Skarma has his own quality himself, which is brought out in the photographs. Um, would it be would Lamo be involved, do you think? Or I mean they are they're, they're an arts organization, very good arts organization in Ley, to somehow document or at least exhibit them. It's possible. Um, you know, that they'll be interested in that. Mm -hmm. Um whether I suppose I think it's whether uh Skarma would be willing to to part with these negatives. Or, or at least loan them out temporarily so they can be digitized. Maybe that's the compromise. I think that, that would be the secret. Are there, I mean, I was aware there were all sorts of um, security organizations in Ladakh. Some of them were uniformed, some not. Um, would there be, a, do you think there'd be a problem? Obviously, you've got the portraits, but the passport size photographs would be, much, presumably, he cropped them to get just the head and shoulders. Or is that, I mean, that, if they are passport photographs, they're fantastic, much better than the ones we have here. They're, they're all, as far as I can tell, passport photos. Mm -hmm. But it seems that when he did go to some of these villages, people said, oh, while you're here, can you just take uh, uh, less um, formal and and, uh, and and broader perspective photographs? So they're not all just head and shoulders, which is the interesting thing, although that's what I've used in this film. That's interesting. Um, when I was back in Zanskar in, 19, in 2017, I think it was, um, which was 40 years after I'd been there, there was, you know, there was internet, they were going for biometrics. They were, they may need updated passport photographs now with, biometric data, this seemed to be the main thing, so they could vote, or um, in some ways you needed it for rations. Um, would, presumably, there must be a, um, in, Skarma must have an extraordinary backlog of names, or you'd have to trace all those people again. It'd be interesting to photograph some of them 40 years later. He has a coding system, and there's numbers on these negatives. Ah. Uh -huh. The only problem is he's lost the key. Oh, so you just can't identify them unless someone comes along and says, hey, that's me. Mm. Um, so if they've lost a little bit of context in that respect. Mm. Yeah. Yes, I took some photographs I'd taken in 1976, 77, back to Zanskar 40 years later, and they were absolutely intrigued. Everything had changed. The houses, the... I was very keen to see in your photographs, particularly down the chat, what people were wearing on their feet. Because that's sometimes some of them were wearing the old jato with just the sort of um, the, the sort of hide skins. Others were wearing a lot of army equipment. Seemed to sort of creep in up the, up the chatter. Um, but they 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 seem to be wearing less of the gonches and the traditional um, clothes in winter, which I found were actually better because they were wool. Did you find that the um, you know that they were going more for the modern? good-looking equipment rather than that which might be more traditional. Yeah, I think the majority of people who walk the Chad are now are using army surplus mm. um, or they're using um, uh, big puffy uh, modern coats, uh, mm. which you can buy incidentally in second-hand shops in, in LA fairly cheaply. Yeah, they will probably come from China anyway. <laughs> yes, could well be, ironically. Yeah. So I, I, I suspect that visiting Ladakh and even visiting down the chat has changed your life somewhat. Would you agree to that? Or absolutely, mm -hmm. I haven't really been uh, overseas anywhere else in the last uh, ten years or so, and uh, because I've I've just been you know if I fly if I'm flying anywhere I'm flying back to India, so it has been rather obsessional, um, and you know this, the the pull is still to go back. Uh, it, I think the chatter does does haunt you somewhat. And, uh, and you just want to get more of it or do more variations of that Chadar route. I think, uh, if anything, what, what might put me off slightly these days uh, is it, the sheer number of people that, that ply that route. And uh, in, I think part of its popularity goes back to a documentary on BBC called Human Planet. And 
uh, there was a, um, a little um, section of that program dedicated to school children who walked along the Chad Artist School, I think. Um, and that brought it to, uh, to a wider appeal and, and that pushed the numbers up consequently. So it, it has become a bit of an adventure tourist mecca, if that's the right word, um, to, uh, you know, uh, to draw in a lot of um, uh, domestic tourists, particularly from, from Mumbai or from Delhi. Mm -hmm. I mean, you went from my point of view very early 2nd of january i we, they always used to say in zanskar you never go until the kasha festival which in those days was about the end of january and that you waited till some lunatics had come up from um from um lay first and then you knew that it was safe but um it does vary and presumably um i mean all those caves have names and they have histories don't they like bakalabao and um it would be interesting to get um you know, to record some, a real documentary, maybe not with film, but at least to get the sort of history and the, what is their, their mind map of the Chadder? Do you think that would be possible? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. It, it actually, it reminds me of something that you said in your book. Uh, you said that the, the frozen river was beyond language and yet firmly lodged within memory of the people who walked it, of the locals. And, uh, and, and so these caves are, memorized particularly well. I think the, the, the memories are perhaps context dependent. So you come around, you see a particular section and that reminds you of what's coming up ahead. And, and you're right, all of these caves are fascinating when you think that they've been used for hundreds of years to shelter uh, weary uh, people on, on this journey. And uh, it is uh, quite a, um, a sorry end to these caves when they're overtaken by road, road, by road building. Uh, yes, that is very true. And in fact, when I was walking along the channel, I started taking photographs of some of these caves, thinking, well, someone has to record these for posterity, you know, because pretty soon they'll be gone. Um, but yes. And there seem to be a large number of caves, and you will only use a certain number. It's like we always used to start picking up firewood about an hour before you stop, but you had to know where you were stopping. Um, and they would put there, as you said, the firewood is really the key to it because they carry... I think you, they can carry no fuel apart from the firewood they gather, and you just often you're putting you're putting your hand behind rocks and hoping to pick something up. Um, but go early in the year, you're very wise. Yes, I mean if you go if you go later, you know you don't have the firewood, and you have to make uh, much longer diversions to find it. Maybe go up some of the uh, you know some of the streams that, that come off the side of the Chadar. Maybe walking for a mile or so just to find it. So it can be a problem later on in the chat. Yeah. Were they, um, you, sorry, carry on. The, the, think about the, the numbers, you know, when you, when you were there walking it, I think you mentioned there were maybe 300 to 600 people in a season um, and they were locals. Yes. And all now, right. you know, you, you could, you could times that by 10 at least. Um, Horrifying. And yeah, yes. Scary. Um, and the condition of the ice, I mean, I, I was, I, I would never venture where you, where you went, particularly when you were drawing the Buddha across that narrow neck of ice that looked particularly dodgy. Um, what they used to do was actually push me out in front because I wasn't carrying, um, most of them had between 10 and 15 kilos of butter on them. So I wasn't carrying the butter. So that I had the lighter pack. They pushed me out first, which was an interesting experience. Um, but the noise, the stick was vital because I remember, and I, I'm sure they did it, it's the echo and you get the sense of the stability or instability of the ice and you get to learn to read the echo. Did you find that was useful? Yeah, absolutely. There's that sort of hollow, hollow, empty sound, isn't there, which says don't go here. Absolutely. And, uh, when you get that nice, you know, that, that really uh, um, solid sound with a stick, it's fantastic. You just... You know, you just crack on and you can make real speed when the ice is good. It's a bit like ice hockey, I found. Yeah. yeah. But the cracking at night is remarkable. It's like a sort of pack ice moving. It seems to move more at night than in the day. It may be shrinking, but it's some of that ice can't go through easily those, when it narrows. Mm. Yes, you get this, uh, the, the shots that ring out. It's almost like someone is you know, going crazy with a gun on the chat arm, but it's, it's the ice cracking 
uh, quite loudly. Uh, and it's not really an unpleasant sound. No. Um, it, it's, uh, it's quite intriguing, actually. And you only get it at night, usually. Is it cool? Did, they, um, did your guides sleep on their knees, as most of the Ladakis did when I was there, or have they sort of got out of that habit, do you think? I think they, they're out of that habit. They, they, you know, they're on mats, and they have um, uh, sleeping bags, uh, military surplus usually. I didn't see them doing that. So that might be a habit that's sort of uh, disappearing. Yes, I mean, they, when I was, they, yeah, they didn't have sleeping bags. They just had the gonches, the two or three cloaks, and then they would all line up and then <laughs> kneel down. And then somebody, the last one in, would put the cloaks over everybody. <laughs> it was an interesting ritual. Um, but were they very religious? I mean, when I was there, they were often chanting mantras if you got to a dodgy bit or they were doing little pujas or they were um, on Mani Padme home as they were getting up in the morning. Um, were they very religious? Uh, I think in my group, not. Um, but we did uh, in one year see a procession of people heading out to see the Dalai Lama. I'm not sure where the Dalai Lama was, but they had to get to lay for onward travel. And they were particularly uh, religious. And I, I, I suspect some, some of them were nuns from, from Kasha or, or, uh, or monks from Kasha. Um, but among the general population, yes, uh, some uh, people are still very religious, but I think uh, much less so than when you were there. And I remember yeah. looking at pictures by Oliver Folmy, oh, yes. uh, yeah. the photographer who, who uh, took a lot of color photos on the, on the Chadha. And you do there. You see, uh, you see groups of people who are reading scripts by, by firelight, um, and that's not a contrived scene. I think that's how it actually was then. But it's uh, you don't really see that now. Things have moved on. The other thing that I found alarming when I revisited Sanskar, particularly in 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 nineteen, oh sorry, twenty seventeen. <laughs> I haven't even climbed into this century yet. Um, was the retreat of the glaciers. And the, I think that's mirrored in some senses by the, um, the lack of freezing and the shortness of the winters now. Um, and that was something they talked about, or they, they sort of, they know what global warming is, and they probably know only too well what global warming is, better than we do. Yeah, indeed. Uh, I think global warming has, has made definite changes to the chatter uh, in the quality of ice and the time at which people typically start it or can start it. And, uh, you know, at one point, uh, Mipan made a reference to that in his narrative. And that's just something he said, you know, it was not scripted or anything. That's just something that came, came, from, his, came from his thoughts, having walked the Chadar for many years. I mean, he's quite a veteran, so he's seen the changes in the ice conditions. But yes, uh, definitely um, global warming is, is changing the Chadar. Because um, I remember also being in Kasha in the summer, and I said, what happened to these fields? They're not planted. And they said, well, we're only planting 60% of our fields because we have not got enough water from the glaciers to guarantee being able to irrigate 100% of the fields. And that, to me, was a, a very stark warning. Um, did their, their village, his village, I think their village was Manda, which is near Ramala, um, up there. Did they talk about that sort of thing? Um. No, not really. I didn't get into those sort of conversations mm -hmm. um, with local people. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but, you know, the, the idea of, of uh, global warming is, is in people's minds in that area. And I think uh, um, that it is affecting, you know, crop cycles. But I didn't get into the specifics with anyone there. Yeah. And on a more naturalist side, did you see many... I mean, you'd be very lucky if you saw a snow leopard, but we used to see tracks of snow leopard and we would see quite large herds of ibex skin. Um, did you see those sort of things? We saw uh, ibex. Uh, we, we followed the tracks of, of snow leopards uh, on, on two or three occasions. Uh, what's remarkable there is that they, you could just imagine this creature almost flowing over the rock and the ice because you just look at where they've walked and you think, how did, how did you do that? Effortlessly, it seems. Um, so it's actually a very, 
it's a very, it's a nice, it's a wonderful experience to 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 go in the tracks of a snow leopard. I never saw one because mm-hmm. uh, they're too clever. Um, I saw a, a fox, um, plenty of blue sheep, uh, ibex, high up, yeah, expert climbers. Um, there's a, there was apparently um, apparently otters on the Chadar. Have you heard of that? No, but there were otter skins. Uh, there was yes. well, there were sea otters, obviously, but otter skins. Sometimes the hats which they wear for the ceremonies, they got a sort of otter skin um, sort of under cap that they have. Um, I've not heard of it, but it, nothing would surprise me. Um, mm. But the um, and there's the fish as well. The weather are mass here. There, there are certainly trout in certain areas. Certainly, they may have climbed, got, somehow got up from the Indus. Um, mm. It. Uh, I think there's a lot more to discover about the natural history of um, of Ladakh. When will you be going back again? Do you think? Oh, there's a question. Uh, I think probably as soon as the COVID restrictions lift. Uh, mm-hmm. I've got a couple of, of projects in mind. Um, one is to get up to date and do a documentary on the motorcyclists who uh, drive around Ladakh, uh, the locals. Mm-hmm. Um, that's one idea. Uh, possibly uh, do a, a, a short feature film as well, uh, scripted. Um, I'm not sure yet. We'll see how it goes. But I'd, I'd love to to spend another winter in Ladakh. It's a fascinating experience, and of course you get to see all the winter festivals, which themselves are fascinating. You know the the festivals at Mato, for example, and. Uh, um, you know, the, uh, um, the, the fortune, the, the future-telling uh, monks who, uh, who are celebrated in that festival. Yes, the Matto of Morocco is quite something, yeah. Yeah, it's, and Stock as well, isn't it? Matto yes. and Stock. Yeah. Yeah. But we'll, we'll see. I'd love to go back sometime next week. Next, next week, next, yes. But next, oh, there we are. There's a slip. Next, oh, year, next year as well. <laughs> next week, why not? Um, Yes, there is something called the, um, the Ladakh Literary Festival, which I took part in this year, and um, I'm sure they'd love to see your films mm. somehow. Um, did you hear about that? Or it was in um, no. December, but it was it was as it was virtual. It was it was easy, and they were went on for days and days. It was absolutely extraordinary. Um, there were contributors from all over, including William Dalrymple, of course. Oh. <laughs> um, yeah. But um, it, it's the, there was a very good group of people organising that. I think we'll throw it open to questions, shall we, Michael? Yes, let's let's do that. And I'm I'm going to sort of take advantage of, of my position and ask a question of my own, really, which is, well, well, there are two two questions. Um, uh, one's a, a relatively basic one. I mean, you've both alluded to the fact that you know, there's a big road building program that uh, the uh, the Chadar is uh, not being used as it was. And uh, so I suppose the key question is, how much longer will it last? Um, I mean, leaving aside the global warming aspect, obviously, which threatens its existence altogether. But um, what, what's, the, what's the prognosis for this as a route that will continue to be used over the next few years? Sean? <laughs> well, I think there are really two chadars now. The, the, the chadar that's, that's walked from necessity that is a, a necessary adventure, if you like. And then there's, there's, there's the Chadar that is walked uh, unnecessarily for adventure by uh, people coming into the area looking for a holiday and uh, an experience. Now, I think once the road is completed and the, the buses and cars start to ply between the Zanska Valley and Ley, then the locals will travel in that way because it's going to be fairly cheap. I suspect there'll still be a cohort of adventurers who take to the ice, um, uh, but perhaps with time those numbers would dwindle um, simply because you've lost solitude on that route. Um, so that, that's how I, how I see things. And, and the, you know, we're, we're looking at a horizon perhaps of, of a decade, within a decade, let's say, I think the chatter will. The, the, the road along the channel will be complete. 
I think the military sometimes they may even draw a halt to it if they think it's too unsafe. They um, wouldn't surprise me. But then that people always get around those sort of things. But they, people are a liability. They forget. I mean, there's some stories of people who made the journey, fell in, got frostbite, then had to be helicoptered out from once they got to Padum. And um, it's not a it's not a light journey. And I was always wary of sometimes even talking about it for encouraging people to take unnecessary risks. Um, what was the litter like, Sean? Yes, uh, it's a problem. Um, you know, later on in the, in the Chadar season, it gets, uh, it gets quite, um, quite dirty on the Chadar, actually. Uh, and of course, you know, come the end of the season, it's all washed down uh, and the Chadar is built again and, it, you know, and it's pristine again. But yes, it, it is a problem, the litter. And it goes to Pakistan then. Well, well presumably, with all, with you know with burgeoning numbers on the Chadar, it's very very difficult to keep it clean in the season, and and people aren't particularly great at taking it away uh, back to Lay. Can I chip in with with a, a second question, really? Um, but before I do, could I just encourage? Um, the audience, please, to uh, to also put your questions because uh, th this is a fantastic opportunity. There can't be many occasions where we have sort of two people who've done the Chadar together talking about it this way. But I, I was fascinated by uh, your your references to uh, this route having really been known. <clears throat> as I suppose all these things were once uh, through oral tradition and passed on you know, cave locations, um, names of places. Um, uh, there, is no, um, there is no Michelin guide. Um, uh, and um, as the route goes out of use, um, presumably, unless it's recorded before people with traditional knowledge die, then the knowledge of that, that route in the sort of level of detail that, that you have been talking about will also get lost. And do you know if anybody is, is actually seeking to, to do that, to sort of get this stuff down um, before, uh, before knowledge goes? All that I'm aware of. Um, I think often the decisions are very interesting decisions, and I'm sure Sean will back me up on this, that you come to a point, and we were in the group of five or six that then became 20 or 30, as that groups coalesce, you get to a certain key point and you have to decide, do we go left bank or right bank? And you've no idea what's ahead of you. And you can go a little bit down one way, then you have to retreat and go all the way back, or you do all this marvellous cliff climbing, which if you don't have um, decent boots is really dangerous. Um, so the instinct, the knowledge, there'll usually be one man in the group who's regarded as not so much the leader, although he is, but they, they, nobody likes to take the lead in Ladakh particularly, but they will be consulted and they will trust. He won't really talk very much, but he will know from having done it so many times that the chances are you go that side or this side, and then you'll prove right. What always looks good isn't, you know, may peter out. So it's a, you're always, it's like throwing dice, you're always chancing a bit. That's absolutely true. Sometimes our little group um, split in two because there was a difference of opinion. And uh, often it was a mile or so down river before we found out who'd made the right choice. It was interesting. Mm. And it's always very pleasant to see people, well, we found very pleasant to see people coming the other direction because then they would pass on information. And in fact, letters, it was the only way letters could be got out of Zanskar. So, and you also felt that you were like, it was like going back to the Ice Age, maybe five, 10,000 years ago, when you really did have to live on your wits. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, it goes back to that idea of everything being uh, essential and elemental on the Chadar, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're, you, you're, you're throwing back in time, really, um, uh, just to enjoy the, uh, you know, the, the, the basic elements, if you like, fire, ice, um, you know, the, the way the, the water freezes in so many different forms, um, the, you know, the light that sometimes comes through and, and lights up a little area on the bend of a river blindingly. You know, these are really beautiful little um, 
little experiences. Uh, it's a, it is a wonderful, uh, you know, a wonderful route to walk still, even though there's a lot of people people do do it now. It was very much a trade route when I was doing it. Um, I only did it twice, but it was very much the only way and the quickest way of getting your butter to lay in the winter um, because there was Amal butter, which was the government farms or cooperative farm butter, which was perfectly good, but nothing like as good as um, all the ceremonies had to be performed with um, Zanskari butter. And they were carrying really some people carrying 20 kilos and they were carrying churpe as well. And they had to carry food on the way down for the way back up. So they were very heavily laden um, and they were tough. They were sort of, they were as tough as the ibex themselves. Did you find that they buried things for recovery later? Yes, if they were, yes. Um, and they had Samper, of course. Um, but if there were lots of groups, you hardly dared do it because another group might find it. Um, but yes, it was quite a, it was an interesting system. They also said it was much better these days. They just get the butter out at the end of the season on a lorry down to Cargill. Or, um, but it was, it had high value. Um, and also there was another nomadic trade route, which has ceased completely now. And this was the site, I remember seeing a thousand sheep, but mostly sheep, goats carrying the salt that had come from Sukha in Changtan um, down into the Zanskar Valley. And so just with little pack animals, they had like sort of five kilos on each side. And that was an extraordinary sight. And now the salt just goes out on a lorry and those, those Changpa have lost their sheep. I, I'm going to bring in a question here from, from Michael Watson, and it's in two parts, really. Um, uh, um, they, they may, the, I mean, it's possible that the second part is no more difficult than the first, but it is a bit more exposing, I suppose. The, the first part is, what is the indigenous language in Zanskar? And the second part is, and do you both speak it? It's Zanskari. They will speak a bit of Urdu, they will speak English. And these days, the eclectic guides will speak a bit of Italian and German. Um, it depends who their clients are. I did not speak very much Sanskari. Um, there were no books on it. The only books we had were on classical Tibetan in the 1970s. Um, there were no books on Ladakhi. It was, I'm not a linguist, I'm more of an engineer and a sort of mountaineer and a scientist. But you don't need very much language. It's fairly obvious what's going on. Um, but I would love to have known far more and their songs they sing at the night and their stories and the mythologies. And they may well have a completely hidden language telling us about the qualities of ice and snow, which I would love to record and translate. John? My side. I, I never, I mean, my language skills are terrible. I, I perhaps learned one or two words, but that was it. Um, it's quite a difficult language to learn, I think, in my experience. Um, but no, I, I didn't really learn much. I'm sorry to say. Yeah. Well, I was very much like you move swiftly said. Yeah. I was going to say, let's move swiftly on then. Um, but Anita Christie um, comments that uh, many years ago, apparently, there was a movement to introduce solar panels in Ladakh. Uh -huh. Did you see evidence of that on your visit? Yeah, there are solar panels. There was a, someone made a film about that, taking solar panels out to uh, a village. I think it may even have been um, Hannah Mill. Um, but you do see uh, solar panels. Yes, they're, they're widely used um, and bring light in the evenings where there wasn't light before, except light provided by paraffin lights. Um, so yeah, very useful. Um, Life-changing, particularly for uh, school children who can carry on doing their homework in the evenings. Um, but yes, it's it's changing quickly. I mean, technology is is coming into that valley uh, and, and revolutionising it, and that that'll that'll speed up when the road is completed, of course. The yes, solar panels are, are quite very important. The little trombe walls. I know Helena Norberg Hodge with her various organisations was very keen to get Ladakis and there are, um, there are even sort of man-made glaciers now. Um, the one thing we never talked about was avalanches because if you get caught in an avalanche in the, in the Chadda and it, you're close to it, you've had it um, because they come down the, we climbed over several big avalanche cones. Um, but a lot of 
you hear more and more stories of Sanskaris who are trapped or, or actually perish in avalanches. Um, as they come earlier in the year uh, and different types of avalanches, of course. I think it was 2000 and 2015 when the Chadar was blocked upstream by uh, ice and rock. And there was a, a backwater, a, a, um, a large reservoir formed and the channel was closed uh, mm. for most of that season. And then when it opened, uh, when the water was released, uh, it actually swept away one of the bridges near to Chilling, which had been recently completed. A big iron structure had only been standing there for two or three years and it was swept away. So there are, yeah, definite dangers. Mm -hmm. Um, and a, a, a simple factual question from Julian Lush. Lush. Um, what is the link slash relationship between the Chadar and Zanskar rivers? Well, the Zanskar, the Chadar is the Zanskar River. Um, they join um, below Kasha. Um, there are two arms. The, the Zanskar River drains about 100 miles, at least, of the main hill northern Himalayan range, the two rivers join and in a way, and then they carry on down. So the Zanskar Chadda is the Zanskar River, where it then joins the Indus. Um, but it often seems to have much more volume than the Indus, but the Indus is the major river. John? Yeah, I, I mean, uh, yeah, the, it's true. Sometimes you get to the end of the, the Chadda and uh, you get to the Indus and it just seems empty. Um, Mm -hmm. and, and yet the, 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 the Zanskar is, you know, is, is a full river. It's quite strange. It is. I think the Indus is longer and it, goes, it sort of drains from, um, drains from sort of Western Tibet, from Mount, Mount Kailash, but um, often geographers give the longer, the longer river. The, I think um, yes, one or two geographers in the 1840s calculated the volume of each river, but it would depend dramatically on the time of year and how much the Zanskar River was locked up in snow and ice. And yeah, I, mean, I have one other question of my own. Mention of snow leopards um, uh, made me um, think perhaps this is too difficult, but um, camera traps, I guess, are the obvious mm -hmm. way to try and get film of snow leopards if you know what routes they they use and uh, and so on. Uh, Sean, have you have you been tempted to try that at all? <laughs> No, I haven't, but I've been very tempted to go snow leopard spotting. Uh, and you can do that. There are certain places. Um, uh, up the, there's a trail up to, um, gosh, what's the name of that? Up towards the, Mar the high Marker Pass. Marker Valley, yes. Yeah, the Marker Valley. Uh, I'm trying to remember the villages there. Uh, Rum is it Rumsi? Rumsi? It is. You can go from Zangla up. There's the Zhonglam that are different routes not always um, available in, in depending on what, what river levels are but um, there's there are organizations tracking them um, local Ladakhi organizations I mean one story I heard was the um, a friend a relative of a friend of mine Ladakhi and he saw this little snow leopard cub come down the river come down the valley and he just sort of said here come with me and he took it back up to its mother I mean and one of the other stories was that old, old, old snow leopards will come down and actually they will come into the villages and just sort of lie there for the last few days of their lives because they realize they, they're not afraid of the villagers and it sort of, perhaps it stops the wolves getting them. We haven't mentioned wolves, but I've seen the action. Wolves are quite fearsome sometimes. Wolves and wild dogs. There's a few wild dogs around. Isn't there? I remember coming out of the, the guest house in uh Kasha and there was half a donkey on the road which had been taken by wild dogs it was uh quite a yeah quite a nasty scene but they can be very vicious can't they yes I think they can I mean even in 2018 when I was there we heard that the girls the young teenage girls who were sort of looking after the sheep up on the mountain behind Padum they had three times in one day had to sort of throw stones to keep the wolves off in the middle of the day. And that's quite something. And they have got one young yak and you see them bring these animals down at dusk and they, they don't hang around. 
So I think the wolf populations are going up. There are wolf traps, but they're encouraged not to use them. Well, um, sadly, I think we must bring the meeting to a close there. Um, we will be making a recording of the event available on the RSAA YouTube channel as usual within the next few days. On the 19th of May, we will be hosting a presentation and discussion between Hannah Lucinda Smith, author of the book Erdogan Rising, and Sir John Golden, the UK's ambassador to Turkey in 1992 to 95. The topic is explaining the enduring appeal of Recep Tayyip Erdogan. It will be the first time that the society has held a talk about Turkey since the late David Barcher delivered the Hugh Leach Memorial Lecture in 2017, and I hope you will join us. For now, I would just like to thank Sean for a fascinating talk, James for leading the discussion into some underexplored territory, and to you, our audience, for joining us. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you. Yeah.